Blender geometry nodes are super powerful. And today we're making 10 small node groups that might save you hours of time. Starting off with number one, which is this procedural modeling system using subdivision surface. We're gonna start with this icosphere and we're also gonna connect a dual mesh node. Let's grab an extrude mesh node and set the offset scale at very low. Next, we're gonna add a scale elements node and connect the top output of the extrude mesh node to the selection. We're gonna set the scale a bit lower to about 0.65 uh, and we're going to just add another extrude mesh node and again let's connect the top output of the first extrude mesh node and connect that to the selection input of the second node. This time we're going to scale in the negative so the inner portion actually caves in a little bit. And finally we're just going to duplicate this scale elements node, connect our top input uh, and scale that down a little bit. If we now connect our subdivision surface modifier and up the level, you will see the kind of shape we're getting here. It kind of looks like an asteroid with craters in it, uh, but we're going to make it a little more interesting. Before that though, let's add a set shade smooth node so it actually looks smooth. We're going to add a random value node and connect that to our first scale elements node. This will regulate the size of the holes. I'm setting it to 0.3 and 1. And let's get a map range node as well because I want to use the same random value to regulate the extrude mesh node, the first one. Why do we need the map range node? Because we have to map the random value from 0.3 to 1 uh, to a new value. And in this case I'm going to go for 0.07 and 0.150. Connect that to our offset scale. Uh, and you will see that the shape changes a little bit. Now I can play with the seed and get different shapes, uh, but I'm actually gonna get another random value node, and this time I'm gonna plug it into the selection of the first extrude mesh. This will make it so not the entire ball is covered with craters, we can just regulate how many we want. And we can also increase the subdivisions for the icosphere, so we get this kind of shape with smaller craters. And yeah, you can still play with the extrude mesh and scale elements node to get different kinds of shapes. You might have used the grid node before, it's a very useful node that does just what the name says. It gives you a grid with a certain size and amount of vertices. And for instance, we could model tiles and instance them on the grid so we have a tiled surface. We can do that by using the instance on points node and creating a separate mesh. Once you've done that, you use a object info node and select your mesh that you've just made. Connect that to the instance and connect the grid to the points input. After scaling, you can see that we have a tile floor. It's pretty simple, but I want to make it a little more interesting. I want to channel my Dutch spirit and get alternating tiles, because those are somehow the only tiles we have here in the Netherlands. So, how do we do that? Well, you we can actually use the grid setup that we have over here. If we just add a mesh to points node, and set it from vertices to edges. And finally, we're gonna go to our grid node and change either the Y or the X to be the half of the other value. So in this case, the value was one. So I'm changing one of the values to 0.5. And you will see we have our alternating tile pattern. It's a very easy and useful trick. Next up, I actually wanna lift some of these tiles up. You can do this with any kind of 2D array of points or even a mesh, but I'm just gonna use the alternating tile pattern that we've just created. Only thing I'm changing here is setting the X size to 1 and the Y size to 0.5. We're going to use a set position node to move our tiles and we're also going to get a position node. And we're going to separate this vector using a separate XYZ node uh, and we're also going to add a math node. We're going to plug the X input to our math node and add a float curve. And then we're going to get another math node and set that one to multiply. If we now connect our add node to the float curve value and the output value to our multiply node and connect the final value to a combined XYZ node, plugging it into the Z input, uh, connect the vector to the offset, you will see the kind of effect we have. You see we have this staircase effect, but if you now play with the float curve, you can get different kinds of shapes. If we start playing with our add node, it looks kind of weird. Set the add node to clamp and you will see what the node actually does. Using keyframes, you could animate this uh, so it goes up in the local X axis, which is very cool. And adding another multiply node after the separate X, Y, Z will actually narrow the curve so it looks a little better. But what if we don't want to raise up the whole thing, but only a section of this pavement? Well, that's actually very easy. We're just going to add another math node and set it to absolute. Absolute will just change negative values to positive values. Oh yeah, and just connect the Y output to the math node. I totally did not forget to record that. Let's duplicate this node, set it to less than and connect it up. And then we're duplicating it once more and setting that one to multiply. Uh, let's connect our less than uh, and our multiply value from up here and connect the output to the Z value instead. Uh, playing around with the less than value will now give us a section of this pavement. 
which is very useful for shots where there's, for instance, a pipe going under there. I've used it for that kind of stuff before. Uh, and you can also use this whole function on a mesh. It doesn't have to be an instance. You could also use this group to rotate things in the X direction. It's pretty useful. If you're enjoying the video and you find these tips useful, consider giving this video a like. It helps the video out in the algorithm. And more importantly, it shows your appreciation for my video, which makes me excited to make more of them. Anyways, let's get back to the next node group. If you've ever scattered objects around your scene, chances are you've used the distribute points on faces node. Now this is very useful. You can instance objects like rocks or branches on those points, but it will also distribute points on vertical faces like this, which doesn't really make sense if you are scattering objects that are laying on the ground. There are multiple ways to fix this, but I think this method is one of the more useful ones. We're gonna add a normal node and separate XYZ node. Uh, and we're going to take the Z value and put it into a map range node. Next, we're going to add a float curve and plug the result of our map range into the value. And finally, we're going to connect the value to our density, not the selection, but the density. Now, there will be a lot less points on our surface. So let's just create a math node, set it to multiply to get those numbers up a bit. There we go, but still we see points on slopes that are very vertical looking. Going back to our map range node, we can increase the from min value to something we like. This is the absolute maximum slope that things can be generated on. If it's any steeper, points will not be generated. This already gives us a good result. The very vertical looking slopes don't have any points on them but we can use the float curve to actually make it even better. Basically what we can say is put a lot of points on surfaces that are flat and put just a few points on surfaces that are a little bit sloped. And you can see that it works. Here on the flat part, we have a lot more particles than on the parts that are a little bit sloped. And that makes it look a little more natural. Now using an instance on points now, we can instance this collection of rocks here. We're gonna separate and reset the children and connect the geometry to our instance and also check the pick instance option. Now what I did for this group was very simple. I just created random value nodes and connected that to my scale and another one to my rotation uh, to make it look a little more random. And yeah, there we have a good method of scattering objects. If you've ever used the material editor, you will know that noise textures are fantastic and you can use them in geometry nodes as well. We're just gonna start off with this icosphere with two subdivisions and a subdivision surface node. We're gonna set the level to two and let's also set shade smooth so it actually looks better. Uh, and we're gonna add a noise texture. Now using a normal node and a vector math node set to multiply, uh, we can create some interesting shapes. Now plugging it in, it doesn't look that good. So let's duplicate the subdivision surface node and put it after the set position node. And you can play with the levels on this subdivision surface node to see what you like. But if we wanna make it more intense, adding another multiply node uh, will not really create what we want. So you will see that it grows outwards like that, which is not what I want. Uh, so instead I'm going to pull the noise texture back and create a map range node and set it to vector. And I'm going to set the two min value to minus one. If we now use a multiply node, I'm going to use this value node. Uh, it looks a lot better. Uh, the shape itself doesn't grow, but the noise is more intense. Keep in mind that you can use any kind of texture for this. So a Voronoi or a Musgrave or even a checker texture. I'm also gonna get a color ramp to get a little more control and I'm gonna set the noise texture from 3D to 4D so it can actually be animated. There we go, we now have this undulating blob and it looks uh, very alien-like, very cool. I actually wanna capture this noise texture so we can use it in our material and we do that using a store named attribute node and we're gonna set it all the way at the end. We will connect the color of the noise texture to the value input uh, and let's give it a name. Keep in mind that you do have to use the set material node to select your material. And we can use this attribute we stored in the material editor using the attribute node. Uh, and you can see that we have the same noise, but in our material, which is very useful. So yeah, play around with this, but definitely also check it out with the Musgrave texture or the Voronoi texture. It creates some pretty interesting results. Going back to the grid node, we can actually create some interesting patterns using the extrude mesh, scale elements, Triangulate mesh and dual mesh nodes. Now for the extrude mesh and the scale elements node, set the scale to zero uh, and connect the top side to the scale elements node. This will basically do the same as poking the faces in edit mode. The only thing we have to add to make it really work is a merge by distance node. Next, let's add a dual mesh node and see what we get. Here, we have this interesting looking shape. We can also click keep boundaries. And there are more ways to create interesting patterns. Here we add a triangulate node. 
uh, this will just create triangles out of the quads. Uh, and let's add a dual mesh and we see we have a hexagon pattern. I'm just going to use a transform node or actually two uh, to rotate it and scale it a bit so it looks a little better. Just like that we have a hexagon pattern. And we can even use parts of the previous selection to make it even more interesting. So let's do that. Let's get these three nodes uh, and put them in between here. Connect those up and let's see here. That's also something cool. And yeah, if you keep connecting or disconnecting nodes or rearranging them, you can probably get some very interesting results. Now, what if we wanted to have a portion of this shape only appear in this cube over here? Well, that's very easy. We can create a object info node and select our cube and make sure to set it to relative and then get a bounding box node. We're also going to get a position node. Uh, and we're going to get a vector math node and set it to absolute. Again, this changes negative values to positive ones. Using another vector math node, we can subtract the max value from the bounding box from the absolute position. The result, we will plug in and separate XYZ node. Uh, and let's get a Boolean and set it to OR so we can get both the X and Y values. Uh, and we're going to connect that Boolean value to a delete geometry nodes set to faces. So let's plug it into our selection. And here we can see that it works. We can use this cube uh, to create a section of these uh, hexagons. Ever since we have the shortest path nodes, roots have become very easy. Starting with this base mesh over here, I'm gonna add an extrude mesh node and set it to zero, uh, and then add a scale elements node and connect the top to the selection. Again, we've done the operation poke faces. Now let's add a merge by distance node. The reason I did this is because the path that can be traced across the surface can now take more angles like that, which is very good for the final shape. Next, let's add a control shape, which is gonna be this icosphere. We're gonna use this as the starting point for our roots. Uh, so let's get a object info node and select it over here and set it to relative. We're also gonna add a geometry proximity node and connect our object to it. Next, let's get a math node and set it to greater than and connect the distance to the threshold and set the value to 0.001. Next node is the shortest edge path node and let's connect our value to the end vertex. Might sound confusing since I said the icosphere was the starting point for the roots. This is still true, but it's just called the end vertex. Next node we need is the edge path to curve node uh, and let's connect it up here and connect the next vertex index to our input. You can move the icosphere close to the surface and you can already see some results, but this doesn't look that good. We can make the curves look a little better by using a fillet curve node. We're gonna click limit radius and set it to poly and let's give it a count of like five or something or four. This way you have rounded corners on your curves. Next, let's get a random value node and let's pull the minimum value down into the negative. Connecting it to our start vertices, this will decrease the amount of starting points so you can see there are way less lines going across the surface like this. And we can use another random value node and connect it to the edge cost to create different kinds of shapes. Just play around with these values until you get something you like. Uh, and now let's actually turn this curve into a mesh. We do that by using the curve to mesh node. And let's also add a profile, which is going to be the curve circle. Let's connect that up and set the radius to 0.01. And to make the branch shape, let's get a set curve radius node and pull this out to the side. Uh, let's also get a spline parameter and plug the factor into a new float curve. Using the flow curve, you can create different kinds of shapes for your roots. And to make it thicker, you can just increase the radius of the curve circle. And you can, of course, join the original geometry with this system we've just created. And there we go. We have some roots growing over our mesh and we can even animate them. Just setting a trim curve after the flay curve does the trick. You can then use the start value to start growing your roots. This trick I've already covered before in a tutorial, but it's so useful, I'm gonna cover it here as well. I'll be quick. If you have any shape where objects intersect each other, it can create some problems. First of all, the mesh doesn't look that clean, but more importantly, you cannot use the subsurface scattering or make it transmissive in the shader editor. But if you have a powerful PC, you can fix this. We're gonna go all the way to the end of our node group and create a mesh to volume and volume to mesh node. Let's set the exterior bandwidth to zero uh, and let's up our voxel amount a lot. We're gonna set it to 1500. And you will see it's one continuous mesh, but it's very blocky. So let's shade it smooth with this node uh, and let's also add a material. And next I'm gonna go into my modifier tab and add a smooth node. I'm gonna set the factor to 2.5 and repeat it four times. 
And there we go, the mesh almost looks the same as the one we started with, but now there's nothing intersecting each other. And you can still use any of the other geometry nodes properties that you've made before. Granted, it will be very difficult to calculate. Finally, if you're still modeling fences the traditional way, oh boy, I feel bad for you. Because it's quite easy to make systems in geometry nodes. We're going to add a curve and make it straight by going into edit mode and just rotating this on the Z axis. I'm going to create a new group and add a resample curve node. Let's set it to length and set the length to 0.35. This will make it so the points on the curve are all the same distance from each other. We can see this by instancing a cube on our curve by using the instance on points node. Uh, let's scale it down a little bit. Yeah, there we go. We can see even when we make it longer, the points on the curve will stay about 35 centimeters from each other. Now I'm quickly going to model this fence post over here. It's very simple. And we're going to use that instead of the cube. So let's select it and connect the geometry to our instance input. And because I want to make this double fence, uh, I'm just going to copy the instance on points node and connect the curve and the object just like before. Uh, and let's join that geometry using this join geometry node. Next, I will add a transform after both of the objects so I can actually move these around. I'm going to move them in the Y direction so they are just a bit separated from each other with a space in the middle. I can also offset them on the X axis so they are actually alternating like that. I also want posts at the end so let's create another instance on points node. And for this one, I'm just going to use a cube. Let's connect our curve and we're also going to add an endpoint selection node. Uh, this way the post will only generate on the endpoints. Now I can use the size of the cube and another transform node to create the posts that I want. And next I'm going to play around with the first two transform nodes and with the resample curve nodes to actually make them line up in between the posts. And I also want to delete any in between posts that are outside of the ending posts. I'm going to do that using another endpoint selection tool, but this time I'm going to subtract one from this value. This way we get everything but the endpoints. Let's connect that to our selection input and we're going to duplicate it and connect it to the other node as well, but just change up these two values. It took me another minute or two to line everything up uh, and I had to delete one more of the posts. But now you can see that it's pretty much lined up like that. Finally, I want to create some beams that go in between the posts. I'm just going to grab a curve to mesh node and a quadrilateral. Connect that to the profile curve input and connect our original geometry to the curve input. We'll have to size this down a bit, uh, but we can now move it up by using a transform node. And we can actually create multiple of them by just duplicating the transform node, plugging it in like that, uh, and then moving it up. I'm going to create three beams for this example. The last thing we want to do is fix the rotation. That's very easy. Let's get a curve tangent node and then align Euler to vector node. We're going to connect the tangent to the vector input and we connect the rotation output to all of the rotation inputs on the instance on points node. And if we now start to play around with it in edit mode, you can see that we can make it as long as we want and we can even make it curved. And yeah, there we go. Those are 10 small node groups that might save you a lot of time. Let me know in the comments which one was your favorite. And also let me know if you have any suggestions for small node groups. Or maybe if you're interested in seeing small node groups with a certain node you are particularly interested in. That's it for now. Thank you so much for watching. You can subscribe to stay updated on future tutorials and like the video to help me out. And I'll see you all later. Bye-bye.